Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our seminar this week. Um, this week, we have Matthew Schuster from uh, Strasbourg, who is going to, to give a talk on the role of wind-driven uh, hydrologic hydrodynamic for distribution of classic in lakes. I'm looking for your short bio. Here we come. So Dr. Schuster received his PhD in sedimentary geology from the University of Strasbourg in France in 2002. He then worked at the Universities of Cologne in Germany, Brest and Paul Thiers in France, as well as the French Geological Survey. He now works at the CN CNRS, Senior Researcher at the Institut de Physique du Globe de Strasbourg, which is a multidisciplinary research lab on geophysics and geology hosted by the University of Strasbourg. His early research concerned the pan-environment of early hominins from Chad Basin and Turkana Depression in Africa, which progressively led him to focus on classic littoral deposits and landforms associated to lacustrine systems. And I also may say that I know uh, uh, Matthew from several years, um, uh, already um, we are working together on some projects. So Matthew, um, yeah, the podium is, is yours. All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, okay, so you presented what I will talk about. Um, it can be a little bit summarized on this picture of, of this lake in New Zealand where you can see very nice waves and a nice beach system developing uh, to the left side of the of, of the screen so as you said nicola uh, we met several years ago a bit before this meeting uh, we are so this is me uh, this is nicola here and uh, we are participating to a drilling project proposal of a drilling project in Chad Basin. And this is the, the people who attended this meeting and we already have one paper together, but we hope we can do this drilling in the future and we can publish more paper about that. So um, to start with, um, just a, a very basic uh, definition, what is a lake? Uh, we can consider that a lake is an inland body of standing water occupying a depression in the Earth's crust. This is the definition given by Kelts, but it's very inspired from the definition from Foyle, uh, 1901, uh, who is one of the pioneers of the limnology, limnogeology. So basically, you need a body of water that is enclosed on all sides, uh, and which is fed by different rivers and some river can also uh, represent an outflow. So the earth has uh, something about 117 millions of lakes that are more than 0.002 square kilometers. Uh, that seems to be a lot, but in fact, it's only some 3.7% of the earth's known glaciated land area. So one of the question could be, uh, why do we study lakes? Because it's, it's, if we compare to the volume of the ocean, uh, all the water that is on the, in the ocean, it's, it's very massive and, and lakes are very, represent a very small part of this. So you can study lakes because you're interested in fresh water, which is liquid and directly available at the surface. There is a link with food availability uh, you can consider lakes as recreational areas. Uh, it's also biodiversity refuges. And for us as geologists, uh, it's interesting because it's continental archive of the climate, of the earthquakes, of pollution, and many other things. It's also the living uh, area for hominini and man since ages. And it's also linked to resources, natural resources, such as reservoirs, hydrocarbons, coal, minerals, and so on. This is one explanation why the people study lakes. This, is a coming, this comes from a book from Andy Cohen. And he said that paleolimnologists study lake deposits because they provide science with archives of earth and ecosystem history 
that are both highly resolved in time and of long duration. And that is very interesting because you have a long time period and you can have very uh, fine time resolution. For example, he says that in Lake Tanganyika, uh, it covers more than 10 million years and you can detect um, uh, uh, events that are annual. So that's really important and, and very, sh very provides very good archives in the, in the continental record. So lacustrine, petro uh, you, you, you can also be interested in lakes for lacustrine petroleum system. Uh, here are three example, um, very, um, that, that, that people are, well, uh, that are very famous. Uh, it's in Brazil where a lot of oil is coming from what we call the pre-salt. It's linked to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. You can also have oil in the East African rift system, which is always linked to lake basin. And you can also see China where you have a lot of lake basins that are linked to either hydrocarbons or coal. Anyway, for this presentation, uh, here are the outlines. I will focus on clastics in lakes. Uh, I will try to show you that there are some classical models and that for me, there are some differences uh, with real life. And I will show you this, I will illustrate this with three case studies of, of our group, which are Mega Lake Chad, Lake Saint-Jean in Canada, and Lake Trocana in East African Rift. And then I will propose a kind of updated model, which is the wind-driven lakes. We can have a quick look at what, if, if you have wind-driven lakes in, uh, in Israel, and then I can just and with some future challenges and some take up home messages. So clastics in lakes, uh, generally the models, uh, this is one model, uh, most of the model that you will find is a model with a water body like this and the rivers coming either from the axis of the, of the basin or from the side of the basin and they bring, they bring water and they bring sediment, classic sediments can be pebble, gravels, sand and silt and so on. And this is coming from the river and crossing the basin and it's kind of uh, a downstream deposition of clastics. And that's mainly uh, the way it goes. Uh, we can call this uh, mass transport deposits, turbidites and, and so on. It, hyperpicnal flows. And, and if you look in the, in the real life, then you can see, for example, this, this, I really like this picture is it's extracted from the book of Gilbert, which is a, a very famous geologist. And this is a, a picture from the landscape uh, in, in Utah, in the USA, where you can see ridges like this and all these lines, they correspond to ancient shorelines of the Lake Bonneville. And this shows that um, plastics can also be reworked by waves and, and waves is, can be very important in, in lakes. So my point is that I rather focus on, on, on wave processes, on um, longshore currents uh, in lakes rather than downstream uh, deposition of plastics. So you can see it in another example here. This is another lake in the USA, in Utah, uh, called Bear Lake. Um, you can see nice shoreline all around. You can see a barrier system here that isolates a lagoon behind. Uh, you can see some small deltas with, which have a, a, a shape that uh, reflects influence by waves. Uh, the rivers are not flowing here, but we can see that there are some sediment plumes in the lake and some sediment transport, this uh, more um, yeah, bluish, light bluish colors. They show that there is a, an internal hydrodynamic and this is related to the wind because no river is bringing sediment uh, in, this, uh, in this basin at the moment it is uh, the, 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 the satellite took this picture. So once again, um, there are many things that 
I would say smells, smells like marine coastal muffled sedimentary structures. Uh, you have barrier like this, uh, waves that generate longshore drift, isolated uh, uh, backshore lagoon, and you can have some paleo shorelines that are preserved uh, in the shoreline. So my suggestion would be that sometimes we could remove the, na the name sea and replace it by lake. And that's the idea of the, uh, uh, and the topic of this presentation. Um, it's very interesting to, to, to focus on, on plastics on the, on the coastal domain uh, because uh, the plastic coasts, they are very well known from marine system, but we know them uh, much less uh, for lakes. But it's very important to know them because it gives you an information about the paleobathymetry uh, of course, you have the, 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 the environment ranging from the offshore and to the nearshore and then to the backshore. As you can see here, for example, the names are a bit different, offshore, shore face and foreshore. But anyway, um, I think this, this classification can apply also to lake systems. And that's what I'm trying to show you today uh, with three case studies. Uh, the first one is Lake Megachad, it's in Africa. The second one will be Lake Saint-Jean in Quebec. And the third one will be Lake Turkana in the East African Rift System. So it's three different type of lakes, um, not the same age, um, not the same climatic area, not the same tectonic setting. And we have, we can find common points between those uh, three lakes. So we try to have an integrated approach to these lakes, including geomorphology with remote sensing, sedimentology on outcrops, short cores, uh, stratigraphic architecture with very high resolution seismic, and some hydrodynamics uh, with numerical simulations. Let's start with Megalay Chad. Um, I consider this one as a 100% pure plastic shoreline lake. Uh, you can see it here on this map. That, that's uh, uh, a map that doesn't really exist because the real Lake Chad is here and we just plotted the size of Mega Lake Chad here. But you can compare to, for example, to Lake Tanganyika or to Lake Victoria and it shows you really the size of this lake. So today the lake that you can see here, this is the open water of the lake and Everything that is greenish here, greenish, bluish, is the wetlands, the swampy area. So in the 1960s, this lake that was 20,000 square kilometer. Today, it's about, yeah, let's say 5,000 square, square kilometers. And the maximum depth is about three meters. And in the past, in the Holocene, during the African humid period, uh, this lake was much larger, it was this, shape here that you can identify also with the bluish colors around. So the surface was 350,000 square kilometer and the maximum depth was somewhere here, 150 meters. So um, I started to work on this system uh, when I started to work on my, on, on my PhD. The first topic of my work was to work on the paleo environment of early hominid with one uh, famous uh, fossil hominid here, which is Tumai. And then I continued to work on the paleoclimate of the Sahara. Uh, here is Lake Unyanga. Uh, that was during my postdoc. But during this time, I also focused on Megalay Chad. And here, are, here is a, 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 a list of the, of the paper that we published with my colleague, my colleague and I. And I will try to give you a few information about that. So in Northern Chad, uh, we call this the Jurab Sand Sea. Um, of course, you have a lot of sand, as you can see here in the background. Here you have some uh, typical bacanoid dunes, um, but you can also see whitish surfaces like this that you can see here. And these are lake deposits. Um, it is well laminated finely laminated, and if you look inside with an SEM, then you can find uh, fossils of diatoms, which are 
freshwater uh, Algeria. So it seems that there was a giant lake in the past in this basin. Um, but let's, let me just give you some information about the present day lake. So this is the drainage basin of Lake Chad. It's a giant uh, drainage basin, uh, 2.5 uh, millions of square kilometers. To the north, it's completely dry. To the south, it's wet. And you have the Lake Chad here. The Lake Chad is directly, uh, the lake level of Lake Chad is directly linked to the West African monsoon system. As you can see in this diagram, this is the variation of the water level in the lake, which is ups and down, up and down every year. And if you look at the rainfall in Chad Basin, it's up and down. So it's the lake records the variability of the monsoon. And you can see it here on this picture. This is July 2002. Then you have November, December 2002. And you can see it February 2003 and May 2003. So there is a, cha a change of the uh, water availability in the, in the basin. And you can see these changes even at the scale of several uh, decades. For example, this is Lake Chad in 1973. So it's a real, well, it was a, a big lake. And nowadays, well, tw in 2003, so it's already uh, a very old picture. Uh, you can see that the only area with open water here is about 3000 ki square kilometers. So you have changes at the level of the one year, you have annual changes and you have uh, changes over decades. And in the past, uh, you all know, of course, about the African humid period. And uh, so during that time, the limits of the Sahara and Sahel uh, shifted. So today it's more or less in this area. Uh, during the last glacial maximum, it was much farther to the south. During the African humid period, it was much farther to the north. And there is a lot of evidences such as stone tools, but uh, there is decades of a researcher uh, who worked on the archaeology there in, in the Sahara, and they find a lot of evidences for the human occupation of this present day very arid desert. So, and uh, during that time, uh, rivers were flowing and lakes developed. And one of those lakes is Lake Megachad that you can see once again on this picture. And the, the best way to understand this lake, because it's a very large lake, it's to use uh, satellite images. I can show you how it looks like from the ground. Uh, if you are in the offshore domain, you have Yardens or uh, remains of uh, lake deposits, which are laminated diatomite. And if you go toward the shoreline, then you still have the diatomites here and it grades into sand. And in the background, you have a sand ridge that goes all along the picture there. Um, you could think it's an aeolian dune because we are in the desert, but this is really the shoreline, the littoral zone of the Paleo Lake. So let me show you that with three examples. Once again, this is the mega lake chad as seen with a digital elevation model. And I will show you that there is one large delta to the south, which is here, a smaller delta to the north, which is here, I will show you later. And there is also very nice coastal features like sand spits here that I will detail. So here is the first, um, large delta to the south. Uh, it's the main tributary to the lake and you can really sh see the shape of this uh, delta here with numerous beach ridges inside of this uh, large delta. And this is exactly what we all know about wave uh, influence delta or wave uh, dominated delta with uh, very nice um, beach ridges uh, on the side. If you look to the north, there is another delta here. So the river system was flowing this way. Sediment were spread this way. And this is the part of the, of the lake. And at the end, 
uh, everything is sealed by a coastal uh, sand ridge that you can see here. And this is very interesting because it shows that even if the river here was no more flowing, uh, the lake, the mega lake was still here and was able to build a longshore sand ridge all around the basin. Uh, this is a modern analog in Svalbard where you can really see this river. Uh, there is a sand ridge along, but when the river flows, it's uh, eroded and it's not continuous. So if we go to the side, um, it's somewhere here. I don't, well, you don't see it on my screen. Do you see the pictures, I think? The, the, the pictures of everyone, okay. Uh, anyway, it's on the shore here. And you can see here is a digital elevation model that you can compare with a Landsat, which is optical uh, images. And you can see this shape uh, that is asymmetric that looks like uh, the fin of a dolphin or of a shark. That it, the same is here. And we can detail this. So this is one single feature like this, very asymmetric. It's the paleospit. Uh, the area is named the Goskerki. And you can see inside some ridges like this, which correspond to, to beach ridges. Uh, you can compare this to a modern analog. This is in the Azov Sea. So it's not the same orientation, but you have the uh, asymmetrical shape like this. And inside you have a series of beach ridges. Everything is, you, you can really compare this to the other one here. Uh, maybe I have a picture here, even have a picture here comparing both uh, features. And this is very interesting because it allows you to uh, infer, oops, sorry, the um, alongshore drift so the paleo uh, coastal drift in this lake. And this is more or less directly linked to the wind, uh, the paleo wind regime in this area. So we decided to, to run some numerical simulation because in this area, there is a very basic uh, bimodal uh, wind regime. In the winter, the wind is blowing to the southwest and in the winter, in the summer, sorry, the wind is blowing from the south, from towards the, the north uh, east. So we just used a model, uh, and we 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 used this wind direction. So the first one this way, the second one this way, and we decided to look what we get, what kind of result we get. So we can see that we get. Uh, surface current map and bottom current map and those maps helps you to reconstruct the tr sedimentary transport of the set of, of the sand in this basin uh, it's a bit bad that you don't see this part but it shows you that the the transport is going downstream here or, or down the picture here and you have some areas where you have sinks of sediments and areas where you have a massive erosion of sediment that is later spread all along the basin. Um, and this can explain all the features that you can find all around the, the basin. Um, in the past, we were very interested in the surface current and in the longshore current. But now you can also see in this map that uh, there are some counter currents at the bottom of the, of the basin and some of them flow uh, in the opposite direction of the, of the wind. And this can be very interesting because uh, the speed of this current uh, is strong enough or, or this current is strong enough to transport some silt and to transport some fine sand. Okay, to sum up with this case study, um, we have, uh, we, thanks to the identification of paleo shoreline in Mega Lake Chad, we can identify a paleo lake, which was giant 350 square thousands of square kilometers. Uh, the length of the shoreline is something about 3000 kilometers of plastic shoreline. So there's a long, uh, we still have a long, of, a long part of, of shoreline to describe. 
and this area was occupied by human. From an hydrodynamic point of view, uh, we have evidenced the wind forcing, the impact of wind forcing, and which was mainly dominated by ha Hamatan, which is the wind blowing from the northeast toward the southwest. Um, possibly there were some bottom currents and uh, we could call this one as a, a wind-driven water body, but I will tell you more about that later. Uh, from a climatic point of view, we can see the transition from the high, high stand to the low stand, which is recorded by the beach ridges. And this corresponds to the record of the optimum and then the termination of the African humid period. Uh, yeah, we can call it forced regression. So our next case study is Lake Saint-Jean in, uh, in Canada, as you can see here. So uh, it's, a, it's a smaller lake, uh, 40 kilometer long, 20 kilometer wide. Uh, here is a bathymetric map that we had and you can see the lines of the seismic that we, the seismic survey that we did in this lake and the red dots correspond to coring that we also did in this area. So in this lake, it's a uh, road here, uh, we have clastics on the coast and there is a bonus and this is with what I will talk to you about. So this was done during the PhD of Alexi Nutz who is here and um, in collaboration with people from Montpellier, uh, Perpignan, and also from the University of Chicoutimi, which is in Quebec. Um, yeah, for the, uh, on, on the coast, um, so you can see it's not the desert, it's not the desert like in, in Chad, but you can see some uh, ridges preserved in the landscape here, and this corresponds to the ancient beach ridges of the lake and records the regression of the lake. The, the present day lake is in the far here. This is the shoreline. It's very hard to see from here. So it corresponds to these beach ridges. So there is a nice record of coastal feature, but I will not go farther here in this. Uh, that's just to show you that there are, there are not only uh, morphologies, but also sedimentary uh, deposits. You can study uh, outcrops. Um, I don't want to detail this here, but if you are interested, you can look in the in the papers. Uh, the bonus came from the from the seismic survey that we conducted there. So this is the boat of the of the university there, and this is the equipment that we used. Uh, it's written here in the Mars SOS two two thousand. Uh, it's a compact chip sonar. Uh, the frequencies are from four to fifteen kilohertz. And we did some, yeah, 300 kilometers of uh, of seismic lines. So that's that's the the complete lines. Uh, that's one. That's yeah. That's that the two more most complete lines of the of the um, on on the lake. These are the transect. Uh, but I can show you some details. Uh, some places we were able to identify some erosion feature surfaces, like you can see here with the reflectors, which are very sharply uh, eroded, cut. So for us, this evidence uh, is, is an evidence for bottom current. And then we can also see some uh, sediment body that are lying directly in contact with another uh, sediment unit. And we consider this as sediment drift. And once again, it's an evidence for us uh, for bottom currents in this lake. So we went also for uh, coring, uh, getting samples from the ground. So uh, it's, it was a very unconventional uh, coring party because we hired divers. Uh, we used the plastic tubes. They went uh, down at the lake bottom. Uh, they were pushing the tubes and hammering the tubes and then they brought them back and we had a very basic saw just to open them and to uh, work on the core. So it was very improvised uh, core facilities here. But you can see um, um, we x-rayed also those cores and you can see that there are some wavy lamination preserved in this, some micro conglomerates uh, with the the class which are whitish here and some biogenic accumulation. 
And um, so for us, this is also an evidence for some uh, bottom currents uh, in the lake and sometimes just uh, sedimentation by settling or of, of fine uh, biogenics. And then we also tried the same uh, software, Symfony, to run some numerical simulation. It's not very obvious on this screen, but for example, here we are testing this wind direction. And the idea was to test if everything that is right, written here, SD, which is sediment drift C, A, B, and uh, a kind of, uh, of, uh, of shelf that we have here, if they could be explained with wind-induced current. So uh, that's an interpretation of the currents that we th that were uh, simulated, and um, it fits quite well with the position of the of the sediment drift. Of course, uh, um, yeah, I'm not detailing this here, but you can see this in the paper. At the end, uh, we proposed uh, a, a depositional model and we consider that wind-driven bottom currents uh, can be found and can generate sediment drifts in the, in the lake central. So you have the main wind direction here, wind forcing. Uh, on the coast, you get some speeds. At the end of the basin, you get a kind of barrier island. And then you have... Um, uh, the, 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 the water current is plunging at the bottom of the lake and you have a counter current at the bottom of the lake which can generate erosion and which can generate the, the formation, the development of sediment drift that you have seen here. So that was a very interesting example, the, our second example showing that the wind can play an important role in, the, in, the, in lakes and in the distribution of sediments. So then we decided to try uh, rift, rift lakes. Uh, that, is, that is a bit more challenging because rift lakes are uh, generally considered as uh, dominated by river uh, processes, so generally steep uh, slopes, uh, actual rivers bringing sediment, transverse rivers bringing sediments, um, I can only see here in this model dotted line that correspond to shoreline terraces, but um, no mention of beach, no mention of, uh, of spits and so on. And so we decided for Lake Tokana. So um, you know that in, in, in the East African rift system, there's a lot of, uh, of lakes, at least 35 lakes. And we selected this one, Lake Tokana, uh, which is the largest of the eastern branch of the of the East African Rift System. It's a terminal lake. Um, it's not very deep. The mean depth is 30 meters. Maximum depth is 110 meters. Uh, the length is about 250 kilometer. The width is about 30 uh, kilometer. This is what you can see from the from the rift shoulder. Um, uh, and in the background, you can see the lake here. It's a bit um, yeah, brownish because here is the main river bringing sediment and you have a sediment plume that uh, propagates downstream uh, farther to the, the picture. And if you go to the shore, you can see that sometimes there is, uh, there can be waves and very nice waves. So possibly there is a, a control of the sediment, of the distribution of the sediments by waves. And once again, we have, we've published some papers. Uh, if you need them, I can provide them to you. Um, um, Lake Turkana is a very, very windy place. As you can see here, this is the shape of Lake Turkana. This is the direction of the wind. And uh, you can see the effect of the wind on the sediment. So once again, here, uh, the wind is, uh, you can see the impact of the wind on the water surface here, which is more uh, greenish, light greenish, and it propagates. Here you have rocky coast, but once you get some uh, sandy coast, then you get one, two, three, four, five uh, spits that show you that, that the wind can be uh, uh, very active in, in, in removing sediments in lakes. I just pointed here a place uh, there is a project of uh, wind power 
uh, they plan to have 365 uh, wind turbines in this area. So there's a big project for energy uh, here in this area because it's very windy. So this is just a, a close view of the spits that you can see. So a full series of spits here. And you can even see that the river brings here the sediments that is spread in this area and then is transported here. You have a nice sediment plume uh, propagating this area. Yeah, once again, that's a close view, closer view, just to show you the, the effect of the, of, of the longshore uh, transport of sediment uh, by the wind. So um, to sum up, we have three case study, the case study of Megalechad, the case study of Lake Saint-Jean, and the case study of Lake Turkana. Uh, they, all, of, all of them, they show very similar, uh, similar behavior and a strong link with wind. So, uh, we decided to emphasize on that and we published one paper um, uh, explaining the role, uh, the, the impact of the wind uh, in the distribution of sediments in, in lakes. So we call this wind-driven water bodies uh, because some lagoon, uh, lagoon, coastal lagoon can also behave the same way. Um, basically, we have this three-partite uh, classification. Classical ones are river-driven water bodies with fan deltas, delta in the axis, uh, hyperplicnite, and so on. You have gravity-driven water bodies, which, which, which have more steeper slopes, and you have mass transport or mass wasting lobes here. And we added this one, the wind-driven water bodies. So it's generally shallow. They have generally a shallow mean depth. You have uh, important longshore transfers of sediment, but you can also find, of course, cross-shore sediment transfer. Uh, there is a lot of wave-related features that go from the sedimentary structure to the, to the geomorphological features, and you can have intense bottom current. And our example is, of course, uh, uh, Lake Saint-Jean or Lake Tarkana, but some other lakes work like this. So then we decided to look if um, we can find a basic relation to identify some of them. So we decided to compare the, the mean depths to the mean to the maximum fetch. And there is a kind of ratio uh, if you compare the depths and the, uh, the, the, the length of the, of the fetch uh, in those lakes. So we selected uh, some 33 lakes uh, among the largest lakes in the world, and we decide we try to uh, plot them in this uh, in this diagram. And it seems that when you have uh, an index of one, then it's kind of um, it proto wind driven water body. But then, if you are ab above the, the the index of three, then there are there is very good chance that this is. Uh, um, a wind-driven water body. Of course, if you have a, a rocky coast, then you will not find uh, beach ridges, but you will find erosion by waves. So I can show you a few examples of them. Uh, this one is in Kazakhstan, where you see the different spits developing everywhere. You have a very nice um, alluvia or allu fan delta coming here, but it's reworked by the waves, and you can see one, two, three spits here. Another one here, here in Mongolia, where you can see very nice uh, spits, uh, beach ridges here. Another example with uh, Lake Qinghai in, in China. Uh, I really like those spits here. And of course, Azov Sea is a very nice uh, system. It's not a lake, uh, it's connected to the global ocean, uh, but the, the tides are very minor and, and, and it's really, the coast is really dominated by the wind and at the end it's very interesting to see this very nice barrier island. So um, just to, 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 to finish uh, this, uh, this presentation, uh, one of the questions could be um, is there or are there wind-driven lakes in Israel? Uh, I think it's a bit maybe a, a challenge but I started just to, to look at uh, 
uh, a, a, a wind map uh, that uh, I checked yesterday, and those lines correspond to the main wind direction. So this is the weather of yesterday afternoon. I don't know what is the the, the weather all the year, but it's interesting to see that it's the, the main wind direction is more or less in the axis of the Dead Sea. Uh, and more or less in the axis of the Lake Lison, Paleo Lake Lison. Uh, so that's, to begin, it's, it's a good point. Um, of course, uh, it's a rift lake uh, with very steep uh, shoulders. So the, the, the dominating processes are um, linked to the rivers that bring, that, that, that bring sediment to the, uh, to the lake. So this is something I found on your uh, on your website, uh, it's a nice picture of a flood uh, reaching the lake, the, the lake, and we can see the, uh, all the sediment plume, the turbid sediment plume entering the, the water body. Uh, there's another paper that I, that I could find where you, we can really see that uh, the propagation of the, of the flood in this, uh, in this part of the basin. Uh, it's really interesting to see this map with the with the temperature and uh, and uh, and uh, and the turbidity values, so um, yeah, that's not very good for wind-driven processes. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, mass transport deposits, which are very important because of the uh, seismic activity in the in the Dead Sea. So I can I could see. Uh, uh, many of your 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 papers uh, and and describing these processes and the deposits. So once again, this is not very good for uh, for the for the for the wind driven processes. But um, yeah, let's see let's see what we can get with our uh, diagram here. So I I use the values for the Dead Sea and for Lake Lison. I hope those values are good or not too bad. Uh, so for Dead Sea, we are more or less in this area, in this intersection, if we use the, 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 the mean depths. Uh, so it's clearly not a wind-driven water body. If we use the values for Lake Lison, also with the average depths, uh, we are quite close from this line. So maybe it was a little bit wind-driven. Let's see it. Um, of course, um, the Dead Sea is uh, has area where it's very deep with very steep uh, with very steep uh, slope. But there are some places with um, more gentle slope, and and maybe this area could be places where some wind driven features could develop. Um, so let's see a few places. Um, we are here completely to the north. Um, what I can see is a line like this that crossed the, almost all the, the basin. Uh, for me, it looks like a barrier. Uh, I don't know if it's a barrier, but it's just a, uh, yeah, for me, it looks like a, a barrier, a coastal barrier. So maybe if, if I'm not completely wrong, this could be linked to a, uh, uh, coastal um, hydrodynamics, which shaped this part of the of the of the basin. Maybe you will tell me that I'm, that I'm totally wrong and that this is a fault or something like this. But uh, it was just a, a test from using remote sensing. Then, uh, completely to the south, there is delta. Uh, it's a nice uh, bird foot delta. We can really see this. Uh, this is typical from river dominated deltas. But we can also see some ridges here, which correspond to uh, uh, near shore bars. And, and, and this shows that there is a kind of influence of waves. It's not dominated, of course, but I think there are some, some influence of waves in this area. And I think this is the part of the basin which is not very deep or which has a gentle slope. So it's interesting to see those features. And then, of course, uh, in this area, but in many other places of the basin, we can see strand lines like this, lines like this, uh, small benches, which are the result of erosion and maybe deposition by, by waves. And then I could find some, some papers uh, when, where people show that this 
these uh, terraces have been shaped by by waves i'm sure you know all of these these papers but it's really interesting um, there's not a lot of deposition but there is more erosion by the waves uh, this one is also interesting because uh, if i read well uh, it's an inland dipping backset structure so for me this looks like a, um, a washover fan possibly and this this is interesting uh, sedimentary de deposit which is linked to to wave and and, and to wind forcing uh, there's another paper here where we can see that there are shoreline uh, shore ridges that are uh, presented in the model and here is the depositional model uh, with nice pictures of the fascias which are related and in and, and some of them here we have wave ripples here and here we have a, a very nice sorting of the of the pebbles of the gravels by the by the wave so once again indication for waves and then if we if we consider lake lesion so it's a um, it, 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 it's a very long and narrow lake and if the wind is blowing in this direction or in this direction I mean in the axis then we can have decent waves developing in this lake and, and shaping the, the shoreline um, so this is some of the picture in, in this paper where we can see um, um, the position model ranging from the alluvial fine down to the deep water and I'm really interested with uh, to see that there are beach deposits and near shore deposits um, as illustrated in this picture where we have wave ripples and also here some <coughs> sorry some uh, coastal uh, gravels which seem to be well sorted okay that's it for me so what we can see here for for uh, for lake uh, for Dead sea, the Dead Sea and Lake Lison is of course that it's dominated by river driven processes and gravity driven processes. But we can see some influence of, uh, of wind uh, driven processes. So maybe uh, if we had to put the, the, the Dead Sea and Lake Lison in this diagram, I would have it not directly on this line, but a little bit here to show that there can be some influence of the waves. But of course, I think those processes are the, the two dominant ones. So um, that's it for me. A quick uh, summary. Uh, what are the next challenges for us? Of course, we have to improve the wind-driven lake model. Um, we want to work on modern lakes. Uh, would be nice to have some monitoring of the bottom current with ADCP. Um, it would be nice also to have a 3D very high resolution uh, bathymetric map and seismic lines uh, to work a bit more on the sediment drift which are interesting features. Uh, we want to improve the numerical simulation uh, to understand the link between the wind induced current and the sediment transport. Uh, we are interested to um, export or to, to, uh, to, to look if this concept can be uh, adapted to ancient lakes. Uh, so we are looking for outcrops and cores. Uh, of course, we want to describe fascias and stratigraphic architectures in ancient lake deposits. Um, maybe um, we could also use some 3D seismic geomorphology to identify littoral landforms. Um, we know that uh, oil companies are shooting super high resolution uh, 3D seismic lines. Uh, for, the, for the moment, it's difficult to access to that, but I'm sure we could see some, some features preserved uh, in, those, uh, in those data. And then, yeah, let's, let's dream a little bit and let's uh, dream of lakes in, in, uh, on other planets like on Mars or Titan or anywhere in the, in, in the, in the, in the space, in the universe. Uh, for example, this is a picture uh, that shows that there are lakes in Titan and you can see a ridge here, a whitish ridge that goes here. So maybe it has been shaped by waves. Um, for me, of course, I put emphasis on wind 
uh, as a major agent for the distribution uh, and the reworking of plastics and bioplastics. Um, so it's not only looking to downslope transfer of plastics, but also massive cross-shore linked to wind and storm waves and alongshore uh, distribution of sediment by currents. Uh, it is a process that can be active at the scale of the basin and can be active at any depth because we have seen that we have some bottom lake currents which are not linked to, uh, to the rivers. Uh, we can see here a picture from Lake Van in Turkey uh, and we can see that the hydrodynamic is responsible for the transport of sediments, at least in this part of the lake. Uh, I think that's my last take home message um, uh, slide uh, with a little bit of focus on reservoir rock because um, these uh, processes in lakes can bring uh, a great diversity of plastic sedimentary bodies such as beach ridges, spits barrier, washover fan, niche bar, shore face sand, storm beds, and so on. Uh, even in the deep domain, we can have some kind of contourite or sediment drifts. Uh, the grain size, they can range from silt, sand, gravel, even cobble, depending on where you are in the basin. Uh, generally, there is a good to a very good sorting because there is wave action. Uh, the dimension of this uh, sediment body is quite large because it can go, uh, it can be uh, 10 to 100 kilometer long. Uh, one to 10 kilometer wide and have a thickness of tens of meters. Uh, the connectivity is good to very good because the waves remove the, the muds. And if you have, a, uh, if you are below the action of the wave, then you can have very good seals and extensive muds. So I think uh, it could be a very good um, um, way to get reservoir rocks. And uh, it's interesting also for source rocks uh, because the impact of the, uh, we have seen that when we have bottom current, it's the impact of the wind of the wind at the surface. So uh, the wind at the surface can have an impact on the anoxia at the, bo at the bottom, bottom of the lake. Uh, last point for us uh, as academics, but can also be interesting for industrial uh, world. Uh, it's important to look at that because it helps you to reconstruct better landscapes and climate in the past. Uh, it gives you also a better understanding of the sedimentary basin. What is the paleobathymetry? What was the trajectory of the shoreline? Well, this is all linked to sequence stratigraphy. And then you can also have a better prediction of the distribution of the plastic, of course, for reservoir, but also for aquifers uh, for storage of material. And that's a picture from, from our last paper where in the sedimentary recall, we were able to distinguish uh, sh two types of shoreline, one that is wave dominated uh, with one wave dominated sedimentation and the other one, which is uh, river dominated sedimentation. And we even provide some present day, uh, present day analogs. Um, yeah, that's all for today. Um, I thank, of course, all the colleagues that helped me to, uh, to work on this. Uh, we had sponsors from Total Oil Company, from the French uh, Space Agency, from the CNRS, University of Strasbourg. I was able to spend two months uh, at University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And we have a global project which is called Modern and Ancient Lake Basin Research, which is a very wide title. Um, and I would like to thank you for listening. Uh, I would like to thank uh, very much Nicola for inviting me. And of course, I wish you all the best for New Year. And I really hope that uh, 2021 will not be the, the, the same as 2020. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Mathieu. And thank you a lot for the blessing for the new year. We are, I, I was going to tell you the same. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that next year we will, you will be able to come to Israel and actually see the Dead Sea by yourself. Yeah, and you will tell me that I'm totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, please feel free to ask questions if you have. Um, somebody has a question. I don't see all the faces, so it's not easy. So just get in and <laughs> nobody has a question, I think. But that's the problem with Zoom. I don't see all of them and I don't see the hands. Yeah. Well, I, I have, until people are thinking, I have a question. What do you think is the role? Because you mentioned the Dead Sea, actually, it's, um, it is uh, challenging because um, the Dead Sea is definitely a, a, a weird lake, I would say, a different lake, um, yes. mainly because of the large scale deposition of salt during yes. the Seventh yeah. So I wonder, I wonder, considering the Dead Sea or other lakes, what do you think will be the the, the role of the lithology of the the the, the deposition of the lake, the, the deposits, on actually inhibiting or allowing the the, the morphology of the lake to develop wind driving um, morphologies. See my point? Yeah, I get your point. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, an important thing uh, because uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, evaporite and uh, I think the density of the water is completely different than the density of, uh, of, of all other lakes or, or of many other lakes. So I think this, has, this plays a role in the, in the physics of the waves. Um, yeah, uh, we should... Uh, um, we should use some basic modeling, numerical modeling, maybe to try uh, try and increase the salinity in the models to see how it influences the the impact of the wave and and the formation of the wave. I think at least for you, uh, it, it it can play a, a significant uh, role uh, for turbidites or hyperpycnites. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure you observe that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, there is a question actually of the public, Ahmad, yeah. one of our students is asking, if the lake is a crater lake and situated in a wind zone, how the sedimentation in the basin influ is influenced by the wind? Yeah. Um, uh, if I understand well, uh, what is behind the idea of a crater lake is to have a lake that has a kind of circular, circular shape here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, this is one part of the, the thing that we, are, we want to test with numerical modeling. Uh, we want to test different wind directions and different types of shapes. Uh, it's not the same if you have an elongated shape or a symmetrical shape like, like this one. Um, I think if, if, if sediment is available on the, on the shoreline and if there is wind, um, then you will have at least a coastal transport downwind and you, you can have an accumulation of sediment uh, at the end of the, of the basin, I would say like this. But I, I haven't found any very interesting example because very often the, the crater lake, they have a rocky coast. Uh, um, there's not a lot of sediment available. Uh, there's not a lot of um, river entering in, in them. And, um, and they seem to be a little bit uh, sheltered by the, of the wind because of the, of the shape of the, of the crater. Yeah. Yeah. But it's something import interesting to test, yeah. The shape, the, 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 the shape that you can see on the map, but also the depths. What is the impact of the, of the slope? Is it if it's a flat slope, a slope or a gentle slope or a very steep slope? This, this, is, uh, this is one of the controlling factor too, yeah. I agree. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody else has a question? Ethic. Yes. Um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, it was very interesting, and he was switching around the world. 
uh, <clears throat> you were showing the different styles of the legs, but do you have uh, examples in which the styles change, uh, change with climatic changes that you go from a uh, wind control to sediment control uh, and you see the, the interplay between the two? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I don't have an example for the moment where we see the change of the climate, but we have one example in the record where we see the influence of the, um, how we say that, of the accommodation uh, or, uh, and the supply. Um, in, in Lake Turkana, uh, for the Pliocene, Pleistocene, um, we can see that we shift from one type of shoreline like this, which is clearly wave dominated, to a shoreline that is not wave dominated. So we, we change the type of lake because uh, we are in a phase where we have a shoulder uplift. So we have a high relief and uh, important erosion. So there is a, a strong sediment supply and the waves uh, in the lake are no more able, well, they, they, they move the sediment, they are able to move the sediment, but it's saturated by sediment. So the supply is too strong and, 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 and the, the wave, it's only wave influence. Uh, when we don't have, when we have a kind of uh, quiescence, te tectonic quiescence, so there's a limited uh, sediment supply to the ba basin and wave related processes are able to rework almost everything and we are dominated by uh, uh, wind driven um, landforms and, and, and deposits in the lake. Uh, but for the moment, I don't have an example where we can, s we, we, we keep the same kind of basin, uh, but there's only a change in the, in the climate. We can, we can kind of consider this for Mega Lake Chad uh, but it's a very sharp change with the with the uh, the end of the African humid period. It's 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 too sharp. The change goes from one there's a lake to there's no lake. Um, so it's too uh, too strong climate change. So I have no no idea for the moment of that kind of uh, situation. Yeah. Lake Chad would be would be a lake that is big enough to be controlled by waves because it's so it's yeah. so huge uh, and and yet uh, uh, it's uh, the switch is so is so quick you would expect climatic change to be associated with a a change in sedimentation and then yeah then a change in in in, in lake level I agree. It's a good First point. a pulse of sedimentation, maybe, then a pulse of lake level. Yeah, we can see here on this map, uh, on this satellite image here, um, that is the, this is the shoreline. It's very discreet, you can see here. I don't know if you see it on the, on, on the screen because maybe the quality is not very good, but there is a line here which correspond to the paleo, well, the paleo shoreline, the shoreline from 1960 here, which is preserved. And at that time, it was possible to have um, wind, uh, well, wave-shaped shoreline. But now, um, everything is, yeah, it's no more open water, it's kind of wetland, it's uh, swamped in vegetation. And so this has a, um, how we say that, uh, this is limiting the impact of the waves. Uh, so we don't see it anymore. And so um, um, there is also another factor that controls the, the behavior of a lake. It's the vegetation. It can be also seen as uh, what Nicola, Nicolas mentioned before, uh, the precipitation of salt. So there are some, some aspects uh, of the lakes that can impact the, how we say that, that can limit the impact of the waves. <coughs> So today, um, I think it's, today it's quite very difficult to see the influence of waves in the in the Lake Chad, but if we consider ten years or uh, well 
40 years ago or 50 years ago, then it was possible to see the, uh, the impact of waves, very limited. I guess also sun, the sun should also be the, the same thing. In the humid period, there shouldn't be sun, so much sun, and suddenly the sun should come in. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you try to fly uh, radar missions over the Lake Chad? Uh, no, I didn't, no. That would be something to, because sun is, is an ideal medium for radar, for a, yeah. Uh, and so that would be something to maybe play with is to fly radar over uh, instead it's like you're doing sub bottom profiling in a yeah. full lake you can do radar in an empty lake and that could be an interesting thing to to try maybe yeah okay thanks yeah good idea okay thank you itik um more questions we are a little bit over the time, but okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, it was really enlightening. And uh, really, again, I hope that uh, next time you will be able to actually visit us on person. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Yeah. And to visit. Uh, yeah, I hope it will be a very nice, uh, a much better year for, for everyone. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm happy it's the opportunity for me to, uh, to give a talk for you. Um, you asked me to do that in, uh, during the first lockdown. Um, I was a bit, yeah, a bit busy at that time. I was a bit sad to say no. And when you asked me for this one, I said, yeah, I really want to do it now. So um, I was happy to prepare this and, and, and try to uh, to look at, uh, at the, the Dead Sea. That was a good opportunity to to, to read a bit uh, some papers and to see how productive you have been during 2020. <laughs> well, there are some good things with the lockdown, I guess. Yeah, we have <laughs> to look at Happy New Year. Out. Happy New Year to you, Matthew. Happy and New Year to you all. And um, yeah. Thank you very Enjoy much. Enjoy that time. Okay, goodbye. If you, want, if you want, Matthew, I will keep you in the, in the uh, mailing list for our uh, uh, seminars. Yes. You want? Okay, great. Yeah, so I can, I can attend to those? Yeah, whenever you want. No problem. Excellent. Yeah, I and would love to. For everybody, we are moving this week from France. Next week, we are going actually to Abu Dhabi in the Emirates. So stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> great. Yes, Thank yes. you very much. Oh, it's, it's okay. Thanks a lot. Happy New so, Year again. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. So no, no. Uh, to uh, Doctor Nicholas. You, you, uh, so, later uh, on. Later, later on, Gabriel. <laughs> no, it's not a question. We are going to be in Hilat. So how do we connect to this uh, seminar next week? We will not be there. Ah, uh, good question. If you can connect from Hilat, it will be good. Otherwise, it will be recorded. It's okay. Okay. No problem. Bye.